Lord Jesus, who confounded your enemies by covering in glory and splendour your body that had been most insulted and despised, grant us the grace to lead in your likeness a new, divine and immortal life. Grant us, O Lord, to realise in us the priceless gift of redemption, to grow more and more every day from virtue to virtue, until we come to you, O God, who are the source and the true life. Come, divine Saviour, into our hearts, as in the upper room. Repeat in us, as you did to the apostles. With your heavenly greeting, peace be with you. Show us, as in St. Thomas, your glorious wounds, and stay with us for ever. Amen. Let us pray. Praise, honour and glory be to you, O Christ, who, when you were given up to the will of your persecutors, suffered many torments when they took off the purple robe, which was stuck to your wounds, and put upon you your own clothes. Grant that after I have put off the clothing of this body, I may be clad with the robe of perfect charity, and that I may be adorned with your merit, and through your mercy be introduced as an adopted son into the heavenly inheritance. Praise, honour and glory be to you, O Christ, who in the midst of reproach and injury bore your cross with excessive pain on your sacred and cut shoulders. Wearied and panting for breath, you toiled exceedingly under its heavy weight. Give me grace to take hold of the cross of self-denial with ardent devotion, and to imitate with the most fervent of charity the example of your virtues, and to follow you in humility even unto death. Praise, honour and glory be to you, O Christ, who, when you were led from the city with two thieves, did not refuse to be pressed upon and thrust, hastened and to be afflicted in many ways. Draw me after you, that I may quickly follow. Grant that for your sake I may entirely deny, forsake, and go out of myself. Give me grace to think of you alone and to find no joy except in you, my Redeemer. Grant that I may love you alone and may return love for love, May I earnestly seek after you, and live to you alone. Praise, honour and glory be to you, O Christ, who, when bowed down by the weight of your cross, at length reached the place of punishment, where, offered e quite exhausted, they offered you wine mingled with gall. May you extinguish in me all gluttonous and carnal desire, giving me grace never to consent to any impure or unlawful pleasure. But may I take my food in moderation to the glory of your name, and may hunger and thirst after you alone, and find no pleasure or gladness except in you. Praise, honour and glory be to you, O Christ, who was stripped before the gaze of all people on Mount Calvary, and the soreness of your wounds being increased by the removal of your clothing. You did not refuse to undergo, for my sake, the most dreadful pain. Grant that I may love the spirit of poverty, and never be disturbed by want or scarcity. Give me grace to bear patiently any difficulties or troubles in this life, for the glory of your name. Strip my heart of every vain fancy and affection, and grant me a holy intent with pious desires renewing within me daily a most pure love for yourself. Praise, honour and glory be to you, O Christ, who gave himself up to be extended naked upon the wood of the cross and the joints of your most holy limbs to be wrenched apart, most cruelly nailed and fastened thereto. Then, for my sake, you suffered your most delicate hands and feet to be most deeply wounded. Grant, O Lord, that I might remember 
with a faithful and grateful heart this your unspeakable charity when you did of your own accord stretch out your hands to be bored and your feet to be pierced through O Lord enlarge and extend my heart by a perfect love of you pierce it and fix it to yourself with the nail of your sweetest love and shut up within yourself alone all my senses all my thoughts and all my affections Amen O Lord open our lips and our mouths shall sing your praise
A reading from the Gospel according to St. Luke, chapter 7. When John's messengers had departed, he began to tell the multitude to pet John. What did you go out into the wilderness to see? A reed shaken by the wind? But what did you go out to see? A man clothed in soft clothing? Behold, those who are gorgeously dressed and live delicately are to be found in the king's courts. But what did you go out to see? A prophet? Yes, I tell you, and much more than a prophet. This is he of whom it was written, Behold, I send my messenger before your face, who will prepare your way before you. For I tell you, among those who are born of women, there is not a greater prophet than John the baptizer. Yet he who is least in God's kingdom is greater than he. When all the people and the tax collectors heard this, they declared God to be just, having been baptized with John's baptism. But the Pharisees and the lawyers rejected the counsel of God, not being baptized by him themselves. To what then should I compare this people of this generation? What are they like? They are like the children who sit in the marketplace and call to one another, saying, We piped for you and you did not dance. We mourned and you did not weep. For John the baptizer came, neither eating them bread nor drinking wine, and you say, he, he has a demon. The Son of Man has come eating and drinking, and you say, Behold, a gluttonous man and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. Wisdom is justified by all her children. One of the Pharisees invited him to eat with him. He entered into the Pharisee's house and sat at the table. Behold, a woman in the city who was a sinner, when she knew that he was reclining in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster jar of ointment, and standing behind at his feet weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears, and she wiped them with the hair of her head, kissed his feet, and anointed them with the ointment. Now when the Pharisee who had invited him saw it, he said to himself, This man, if he were a prophet, would have perceived who and what kind of woman this is who touches him, and that she, she is a sinner. Jesus answered him, Simon, I have something to tell you. He said, Teacher, say on. A certain lender had two debtors. One owed five hundred denarii and the other fifty. When they couldn't pay, he forgave them both. Which of them do you suppose will love him the most? Simon answered, He, I suppose, to whom he forgave the most. He said to him, You have judged correctly. Turning to the woman, he said to Simon, Do you see this woman? I entered into your house, but she, since the time I came in, has not ceased to kiss my feet. You did not anoint my head with oil, but she has anointed my feet with ointment. Therefore I tell you, her sins, which are very many, are forgiven, for she has loved so much. But to whom little has forgiven, the same loves little. He said to her, Your sins are forgiven. Those who sat at the table with him began to murmur amongst themselves, Who is this who even forgives sins? He said to the woman, Your faith has saved you. Go in peace. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Jesus was dining with an important person, a member of the Jewish religious hierarchy, and we can picture the scene, lots of show, so that everyone would see how important this man was. Jesus was not that impressed, saying that he had been given food to eat, but no water to wash his feet. The woman, on the other hand, goes to great expense. She cannot invite Jesus to her house, but she has a pot of expensive ointment which she uses to refresh his feet. When Jesus was rebuked for allowing this to happen, he turned the event around and asked which of the two loved him more. 
the official who no doubt thought himself very proper, or the fallen sinful woman. The man who has ostensibly little to be forgiven, or the sinful woman. His host correctly answered that it would be the woman. How much do we love Jesus? How much do we express our love and our thanks for all that he has done for us? We need to understand some of the peculiarity of Oriental customs together with the earnest and eagerness of this particular penitent, this woman. And then we can understand to account for her effecting an entrance into the house of the Pharisee and gaining access to the feet of our Lord. And the lessons we can gain are fundamental. Firstly, that there is free and full forgiveness for the worst of all of us. It is somewhat striking that although Old Testament scripture abounds in pas passages which attest the greatness of God's mercy to the repentant, the Jews of our Lord's time had no place for such in their system or their practice. This could not have been from unfamiliarity with the sacred record, but it rather arose from ignorance of themselves. For they did not acknowledge their own sin, or any shortcoming in their own lives. Simon probably thought that Jesus was putting the debt which, replicate, which represented his obligation, 50 pennies, at a high figure, and so mistaking themselves. It is not to be wondered that they took a false view of their neighbours, that they looked upon those who were outwardly bad as being hopelessly irrecoverable. But not so our Saviour. By action as much as by language, he made it clear that the guiltiest of men and the worst of women may come in penitence and be restored. That is the valuable and lasting significance of this attitude, of his attitude on this occasion. His treatment of this woman, together with the gracious words to her in verse 48, are to us, as they ever will be, the strong assurance that those whom we most unsparingly condemn and most scrupulously exclude may find mercy at his feet. Secondly, that not her love but her penitence was the ground of her forgiveness. When Christ said, Her sins which are many are forgiven, for she loved much, he did not and could not have meant that her love was the ground, but that it was the consequence of her forgiveness. It mean, he meant to say, You can see that she has been forgiven, for you see how she loves, and it is only they who have been forgiven what she has been forgiven that love as she loves. The fullness of her love is therefore the proof, but not the ground, of her forgiveness. What led to her forgiveness was her penitence. The bitter tears she shed in verse 38 were the tears of a true contrition. They meant a holy hatred of her past sin and a sincere determination to lead another life, not being repelled but accepted by his holy and merciful deep and strong gratitude arose in her, and the penitence, the love and the new and blessed hope surged and strove together in an uncontrollable emotion within her heart. When God shows us our fault, we should go at once to the merciful Saviour, and trusting in him, we are received and restored. And then a pure, deep, lasting love arises in our souls. It is the simple, natural, beautiful outgrowth of penitence and faith. Thirdly, that the sense of God's grace to us all will determine the fullness of our affection toward him. To him whom little is forgiven, the same loves little. If we have an imperfect sense of our guilt, and therefore of God's mercy to us, our response in gratitude and love, will be far below what it should be. It is therefore of the gravest importance that we should know and feel our own fault, faultiness in the sight of God. 
for clearly it is not the magnitude of our past sin, but the fullness of our sense of guilt, which determines the measure of our feeling in the matter of gratitude and love. And it is for this that we must look. We shall find it as we dwell on the greatness of God's goodness toward us in his providence and in his grace, in the poverty and the feebleness of our filial return to him for all his love and care and kindness toward us, in the fact that he has been requiring purity of thought and rectitude of soul and sincerity of motive, as well as propriety of word and integrity of deed. For this also we must pray, asking for that enlightening spirit who will show us our true selves and fill us with a great sense of our own true unworthiness and our many wickednesses. Let us pray. Almighty God, who through your only begotten Son, Jesus Christ, overcame death and opened to us the gate of everlasting life, we humbly beseech you that, as by your special grace preventing us, you put into our minds good desires, so that by your continual help we may bring the same to good effect. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, ever one God, world without end. Amen. <laughs>